Welcome back to Following Note on a Stormlight Podcast. This week is episode 89, and we are talking about one chapter. That's it. One chapter this week. And you guys know how long this episode is, because you can see the time bar, but we have no idea, because we're just starting it. So, how are you, Paul? We're talking about one chapter. Doing great. You said I don't know how long this is. Well, tell me that the the duration of this video is not 52 minutes and 37 seconds because i can see the future so um i'm doing great thank you for asking i am a little more under control of uh my thoughts and feelings and emotions this week just talking about one chapter even though i don't know how we're going to navigate this one single chapter so elliot there's so much packed into this one chapter. It's just crazy. Like the sheer amount of stuff that happens. Nuts. It's it's the action sequence of it's the Battle of Minas Tirith equivalent. It's the Battle of Thalen Fields. Chapter 120 of Oathbringer. Who's on our mug, Paul, before we get started? Our mug. A great, great, great uh person and a patron and Everything on our mug this week we have dun 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 Eddie, it's a white mug, so it's glaring a good bit. Um also I feel the urge to re apologize for my handwriting because every week I try my best to write names legibly and it looks tough. But Sean Eddie is an ardent, has been supporting us for months now, and we really appreciate it a lot. I realized last week I didn't actually talk about my my mug at all. This week, uh, my mug is from The Office. It is all the words to the scene of Boom Roasted. If you're an Office fan or you watch The Office, anyone watching, um, it's all the, the Boom Roasted bit, which I love. So thank you, Sean Eddy. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Sean Eddy. Do you have two words for two hours of your audiobook, Paul? Sure. I have two words that are gem and light. All right. Gem and light. Uh, Elliot. Two words that I almost picked myself, gem and light, were two that I thought about. But instead, I went a different direction and decided on subdue and strength. All right. Let's use these four words and talk about Oathbringer. All right, Elliot, tell me about your words first. So I picked strength for the large amount of feats of strength we see in these in, in these chapters chapters one chapter in these scenes of this one chapter we see amaram wield quite a bit of strength and different abilities and powers that i want to talk about we see renarin be incredibly strong we see adolin wield some some strength and then we see apparently rock wield some pretty incredible strength i'm excited to talk about that on the flip side i pick subdue for two specific instances of the subduing of a spren the first is dalinar capturing the thrill wow crazy scene and the second one is venly apparently subduing the void spren within her and replacing it with that little ball of light spren that's been following her around so i want to talk about that with you guys too yes sounds good uh paul oh is this my my words yes um so i had no clue how to summarize this in two words. So my two words are just two things that I thought were interesting here. Um, so 
kind of nearing the end of our situation we have. Dalinar has I believe a golden gemstone sphere in his hand. Is that right? He is a glory spread. Oh, that's right. It's and, like But he also has the King's Drop, which is a ruby, and it's mm-hmm. not infused at the beginning of the chapter. Gotcha. Okay. So part of it is with the King's Drop. We've seen a increase in mysterious spheres and gemstones that don't work like the rest. And as I so uh, knowingly said two, I think, episodes ago, maybe three, something like that, uh, that these are Dawn Shards, right? We'll see if that happens. Okay. Um, th- there's a lot of these gems and gemstones that seem to happen. And with everything going on, it just has me thinking about our Dark Sphere again. And Trevor's been so snarky about it since the beginning of our reading that I can't help but think something is going to happen with it at some point, or maybe we'll learn something to theorize on with it. Paul, can I can I butt in for a second on your words here? Yes. I, I was just going to say, I had this thought as I was reading this chapter, actually. I'm getting a little worried that our uh, our dark sphere is actually not important at all. <laughs> I I'm starting to wonder if that dark sphere was actually just meant to be the void light. That all it was supposed to be was an example of not stormlight. I, I could be wrong. It still could be important. It could still be a dawn chart. It could be something big. But the fact that we're seeing all these other objects that seem so important and on a much grander scale, I think back to that one small sphere that just glowed darkly. It, it's starting to sound less and less and less important. That's true. I, I can get behind that. But we have seen a lot of these unique spheres. We've seen this King's Drop, which is very ambiguous right now as to why... We know it's an something that would be effective in stopping Odium's plan. Maybe it's something with like a perfectly cut gemstone can counteract an unmade. We don't no idea. Um, but I can't help thinking that there's some correlation. So I am very curious to find out what our ambiguous gemstones are here for. Um, and. For whatever reason in my head, I had it. I thought this glory spread in Dalinar's hand was like a sphere with a golden gem in it. I guess I I probably heard that wrong. That is not the case. And I got really excited. I was like, here's another one of our <laughs> crazy, mysterious gemstone spheres. So. Well, no, it's just a glory spread. It's just some random little glory spread. Like, what's he doing stealing the spotlight? <laughs> <sighs> what a shame. So uh, my other word is light and it's partly for the stuff I was saying and partly because I can see the light at the end of the tunnel of our story at this point. And so that's something to uh to look forward to, I guess, or to, to be excited about. To answer your King's Drop question, um it's all about host, hosting the spren. So a soul caster will break its gemstones eventually because gemstones, no matter how perfect you seem to cut it, they're, they're still going to be flawed and the spren's still going to escape. At the end of this chapter, we realize why we're after the king's drop, or at least Dalinar realizes at the end of last chapter, the beginning of this chapter, why we're after the king's drop. And it's to host the unmade Nergaul like a soul caster. And it appears to have a natural perfection. Now who knows who made the King's Drop to begin with, but everybody assumes it's a natural gemstone that never loses its stormlight. Therefore, it can be a natural stone that never lets the Spren escape from it. Odium knows this ahead of time, sends an advanced force for the King's Drop because he knows that's the one weakness for the Thrill. Even if our heroes don't know that, 
at the time, Odium just plays his hand too fast, and they realize why they need the king's drop. Does that make sense? Because it can infinitely mm-hmm. hold the thrill. Yeah. But before we get there, we're going to talk similar to what we did last week, not in chronological order of the chapter, but in character order. We're just going to pick a character and talk about their journey from the beginning of this chapter to the end of this chapter. I want to start with, let's actually start with Venli. She gets a very short time, well, she gets a very short page and a half-ish in this 60-page passage that we're in. But it's really important. Either of you guys want to talk about this? I I like the, the bit with Venley. And we mentioned it before, last episode, last week. That Venley speaks the first ideal of the Order of Knights Radiant here. And she faces a little adversity while she's trying to do it. She like gets halfway through it and then she gets interrupted by a Fused. Who, I, I couldn't tell if the Fused could like tell she was speaking the ideal and was like trying to stop her or if it just was a little bit of coincidence that the fuse was like hey why aren't you in the battle sort of thing but she she gets through it she speaks the ideal venley's a knight radiant now wow i didn't pick this up until this time reading through it but the fuse who overhears her runs to her satchel and is looking for a sprint is looking for a radiant spread in her satchel. Doesn't find Timber. But the satchel's where Timber's been hiding. At that point, as she's saying the... As she's saying the, the first ideal, Timber enters her gem heart, and that's where he's hiding. And he overcomes the void spread in Venli's gem heart and captures it, which... Elliot, that was one of your words, so I'll throw it back to you, uh, or Paul, if you want to chime in here. But Timber, as she's saying the first ideal, it gives Timber the power to overcome the void spread in her gem heart, and she becomes a Knight Radiant. I liked how, as she's saying the, the ideals as well, she's thinking through kind of what Dalinar has said to her and what Dalinar has shown her through his actions and his struggle with Odium. She she talks about in this section how she's kind of gotten sucked up in the whole ambition of the, this whole effort with Odium, this whole um, knowledge and wealth and achieving something. That That's kind of what's been fueling Venli in this, and she realizes that's not right. And that she needs to think about you know who's right and who's wrong here. And she sees Dalinar say, "You can change." And so she says that to herself as she's doing as she's doing it. She says, "You can change. You can become a better person." As she's saying this this ideal, which was pretty cool. So basically tying that back to Dalinar saying Dalinar kind of being the inspiration for this moment was cool. Does this? make more sense why Venli is our point of view character for Rhythm of War. Absolutely. Uh, we've we had talked about it before that we were surprised Venli would be the the fourth book point of view chapter because we've just seen bits and pieces and it doesn't seem like there's anything that crazy or notable. But We've seen a good bit of development, and most of it has come from whenever she discovers this little spren, Timber. Um, that partnered with when Eshenai dies early. That's in this book, right? Yeah, that's in like the end book somewhere. End of rhythm or words of radiance. Okay. Um, when Eshenai dies, in my head, things started to shift a little bit because she. With all the changes to the to the Parshendi, Parshman, everything, um, it kind of felt like it was her and Esh and I still like bonded together really strong, like really good allies. Even though there was a lot of craziness going on, and Esh and I becoming a few years, all this stuff. When Esh and I died, it really felt like she was kind of 
isolated from the rest, even though she isn't physically. She's there, she's part of their coalition and everything. But, she, you know, she kind of sticks out. Um, and Temper has really brought that out to full force, and that we know there's going to be a lot more development and shifting and things like that to happen. Um, Maybe yep. Kaladin's fourth idea will have to come in with protecting Venli. Protecting oh. a... Okay. A, 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 a void bringer, if you will. Okay. I don't know how, but... Along those know. lines, I'm, I'm very curious, and I'm, I'm sure if the whole next book is focused on Venli, we'll get to see it. I, I'm curious to see singers, listeners, whatever they are, coming together with humans and having to work together or, or starting to maybe like negotiate a little bit, or instead of just being us versus them, can we start to navigate a, how do we work together? Are we really enemies of each other? Like I, I want to see that start to become the the questions of the, of the plot line. So I wonder if Venley is going to be an important, you know, keystone in that. We, we have our, a couple oddballs on each side already. We have Venley, of course, who is an oddball for the singers. We have Verlaine, who is still with us in Bridge 4. And then we have Renarin, who is with us and seems to have bonded the wrong Spren. So that's yeah. a, that's an interesting one. So we've got a couple of blurred lines there. It's no longer A versus B. It's, you know. I had thought about that with Relaine, and I had also thought about it with Kaladin, because I feel like Kaladin has begun developing a soft spot for a lot of the Parshendi right. uh, that we've seen. I don't remember all the names, but whenever he was captured and then spent time with the that group there, and then it comes to a really sad point at the end of part th three. three. Three? Yep. Okay, yes, at the end of part three. Um, where he watches them fight the Alethi, and it's it's really really heartbreaking and very sad and devastating. But we see that he has like a big heart for them, and I could definitely see there being like a a coalition of like trying to recruit or persuade or discuss or negotiate with our Parshendi that aren't fused or will listen or something. So. Anything else? I am incredibly excited to see dialogue from our... Uh, we talked about it last episode. Assumed Will Shaper, potentially. Like, theor theorized that she may be a Will Shaper. So. And I, I want some confirmation of, yeah, what exactly she is. Because I feel like we're going on pretty much just a guess at this point that she is a Will Shaper. I'd be... I'd be really interested to learn if that's actually even true or if she is going to be something different. All right. Shalon. Moving on to Shalon's part. We kind of skipped over her last episode. There wasn't too much content. Everybody else had the stage for for last episode. However, there's a couple key moments for Shalon in this episode. And I want to highlight them here. In our last chapter that we read before this, everybody assembles. We've got our nine ninths radiant, potentially ten. We don't know where the tenth is. And the Stormfather says, I mean, at the end of the day, there's only nine of you. You can't, you can't win this. And so Dalinar turns to Shallan and says, hey, can you light weave an army for us? how Sadius isn't going to care what they're killing they just want to see blood so she light weaves an army a fake army of anyone and everyone she's ever sketched and feeds them to how Sadius okay, in her previous episode Trevor you mentioned that Brandon Sanderson said light weavers are the most powerful radiant order potentially most and destructive. This is what I, oh yes, most destructive. 
This was where my mind went whenever you said Lightweaver, was that she created, like, an army. She just, like, made an army out of illusions, and they weren't real, right? They can't actually hurt anything, as far as I know. There's... Um, well, there's minor substance, but she... These are not aggressive illusions. Okay. Whether they actually have physical contact is up for interpretation. I'll put it that way. Okay. I was under the impression that apparently are that they do like at least like if they get killed in quotes, they're not like disappearing into mist or whatever. They're like falling over and like I don't know, look they're, actually de- like a they're real making a dead scene body. Yeah. Yes, they they look legitimate. They look real on paper. They're just not, you know, really real, right? And so it talks about how the the fears just keep fighting these because they're like, there's people, right? We're going to kill them all. And that was just like a really, like, really awesome and, like, effective thing with Shallan, which I thought was really cool. And it was cool to see Shallan really have, like, a super impactful, like, battle fight tactic implication with her powers. Um, because when we learned about her stuff, I thought, wow, she's going to be excellent as like an undercover spy. Um, and that's what we've, we had seen, um, but not so much of like an upfront battle. And that was really, that's really awesome to see. I was excited. I, I completely agree. Even, even semi recently in the story, I still had Shalon kind of categorized in the scholar spy behind the scenes kind of character. And then here she is holding the entire front line in a, a war that this, this is another like huge step up for Shalon in just her powers. Like I was that th- this was very impressive that she can pull together this kind of a feat. Not only that. So, so, so with her pulling off this kind of a feat, I thought about it. Like when she, what was it? In Words of Radiance, or specifically, I'm thinking of whenever, well, partly whenever she's learning light weaving, and partly when she has the like, uh, it's an iconic scene. I forgot the name of it. The girl who looked up or whatever. Right. Um, that scene. It. She talks about how like to make like a flawless or like you know, pretty seamless illusion. It took really like vivid memory, memory, and like imagery, and a good bit of effort for her to have someone. And then she has now gotten to the point where she's making an army of convincing soldiers, right? And that's really crazy to see that growth. I had one little question, which is it's not a rabbit trail, but it's not important. Um, we were talking about our what was it called? Our like ideals. We were talking about it with Kaladin and Zeth, like are they the second, third, fourth ideal, whatever. Don't light weavers not have any past the first and they just have a first ideal or like, cause we haven't seen anything with that. So and I feel like I remember hearing that somewhere. So light weavers have truths instead of ideals. They sub. So the, mm-hmm. what you're thinking of is the nice radiant quiz. What, when we read the Lightweaver portion, we it says the Lightweavers have the first ideal, and then after that they substitute truths they have to come to grips with with between them and their spren, and their spren lets them progress p- past that. Okay. The, the two truths we've seen Shalon say at, up to this point is, I killed my father, that was her second ideal, and I killed my mother. That was her third ideal. So, she's she's got pattern as a shard blade, but she doesn't have her armor. As far as we know, there's a there's a a technicality in here that I wanted to come back to here in a second. But if you have something to add, go for it. It's all I had thought of, at least. So. Yasna has her own thing, which we'll get to here in a second. But Yasna gets on top of the wall, 
sees Shalon is about to run out of Stormlight, comes down and starts helping her because we'll get to it in a second. But Yasta is super powerful, and she runs over and saves Shalon, and all of her illusions are kind of evaporating because they're running out of Stormlight, and she fails. She saves Shalon with like a wall of tar or something. Uh, from the fused turns around and Shalon evaporates into mist. She's that's not actually Shalon, the one that uh, Yasna bent over backwards to save. Yasna summons Veil and Radiant in here, and the real Shalon is actually Radiant in full shard plate. Did you guys catch that? We were catching that she was as radiant. So what I did notice, and I believe it's that scene, there's a bit where Shalhan basically says something where she's like, all right, after this, I'm going to settle back to just being one person. And then after that, immediately after that, like the dialogue is and radiant said but i i had not gone the step to assume that like that's that's the real shalon there that that is what's standing there in front of yasna is the the radiant in full shard plate and and armor and and all of that so Shalon, at, it's kind of hard to, you know, there's a lot of stuff going on, but Shalon light weaves herself as Shalon yeah. and then switches her actual self to Radiant and either light weaves shard plate on herself or actually has shard plate on herself. So either we missed a fourth ideal and we haven't talked about it yet, or she's light weaving shard plate on herself interesting very interesting i did not think about that because that's been a big moment that i've been really waiting for is who's going to be the first person to hit the fourth ideal because we know it's shard plate that's what you get when you hit that that ideal we've learned that much but we're kind of waiting for someone to get there so if this is the moment where Shalon does that, that's even way bigger than I thought. But I hadn't even picked up on any of that. Interesting. We'll come back to this in a second. But speaking of the first person to speak the fourth ideal, Yasna is tasked with defending the breach in the city. And she actually goes one step beyond that and just soul casts a new wall in place of the other wall so and she does it really quickly too she within like the her first scene there's a new wall just popped up right there adolin which we'll get to here in a little bit seem it seems like uh, yasna's in trouble there's a bunch of house sadius rushing for the for the breach to keep it open for the rest of their army and yasna clears them all out and adolin thinks to himself like i guess yasna doesn't need any help and but there's a specific line that Adolin says to himself in there. Did you catch it? It's Adolin sees glowing geometric shapes surrounding Yasta. Oh, yeah. Yes. I did notice that, and I wanted to, I wanted to bring that up, too, because that was a, a blink-and-you-miss-it moment that I wasn't sure what that was. <clears throat> I was maybe guessing that was part of her soul casting that she's like soul casted herself some sort of like bubble shield around herself was mm -hmm. almost kind of how I, I was interpreting that in my imagination. But I, but I'm I'm starting to maybe wonder where you might be going with this. I'm not going any further than that. I'm just wondering who there might be other people who have already sworn the fourth ideal who just haven't shared it yet. Interesting.
that's been a big question, I feel like, throughout all of our story. It's been kind of an ambiguous, like, is this person really, like, a new Knight's Radiant, or are they a Herald? Like, I don't <laughs> know. Like, it's it's kind of wild. Well... Because that's how it was initially with Shallan, right? Or... Kind of. Whenever Shallan summoned a shard blade, we were like, what the heck? How does she have a shard blade? We realized yeah. she was already at her like second ideal or whatever, right? Because it was pattern. Well, and Wasn't it? if you give Shallan a little bit more thought, her rules get really ambiguous. Because when she was very small, she had a shard blade. But yep. she doesn't seem to have met pattern until the boat at the beginning of Words of Radiance. You guys, are you guys tracking with me? Yes. So has she already said her third ideal when she was eight and accidentally killed her mother? You know, like what her, her rules get really weird. The more you think about them. It's, it's a bit awkward for sure. I don't. Shalon just kind of does what she wants. I don't know. <laughs> I've almost kind of jumped to the conclusion that it might be light weavers that kind of do what they want. I, I'm thinking yeah, that they get yeah. to maybe bend the rules a little bit, just as an uh, as an order in general, perhaps. Or maybe it's Vale has said the third ideal when she was eight, and then Shalon hasn't got there yet. Like we get all sorts of weird there. Yeah, yeah, no, Radiant is on the fourth ideal. Shalon's just on the third. You know, oh goodness. <laughs> hey, uh, there you go. Anything else for... Oh, there's a, there's a funny moment that I wanted to highlight while we're talking about Shallan. She's, she's basically having a trance with Vale and Radiant and sitting there holding their hands. And Lyft comes up. She, she needs help getting the, the king's drop. And Lyft swings over to her and says, uh, Can you stop hugging yourself for a second? I need your help. <laughs> I, I think... Brandon Sanderson really improved on Lyft as a character in these short few chapters that I really enjoy her dialogue. Oh, the lift the lift banter is excellent in this in this chapter. I wanna I wanna highlight some some banter between her and Zeth when we get to to that section too. Anything else for Shalon? All right, let's revisit Yasna real quick. As we were saying, she's extremely powerful. She can soul cast on command pretty much whatever. People, the air, you know, just walls into other walls. She just summons a a wall of tar, the fuse fly into it, and then she lights it on fire. Like she's got all sorts of cool tricks up her sleeve. And she force pushes this house sadius guy who turns into crystals and then he shatters and those guys and the, the the crystals hit other guys and they turn into crystals like what what is happening here yeah she's not only apparently incredibly powerful she's incredibly creative with how she uses her power like you think soul casting okay she can turn stuff into other stuff but the 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 limits of what you can do with that are you know, endless. And, and Asana really gets creative with it of, oh, let me soul cast some air into tar so that when you fly through it, now you're covered with tar and then one little spark and boom, you're gone. Like, wow, she, she knows what she's doing. It, this is, we've had a lot of really cool fight sequences, but I think this one would be like the coolest to watch. Just because she's used like drawing on so many elements that it's just so dope. It's so cool. And we've seen her do this way back in the Way of Kings, right? With that Ali scene with Shalon and Shalon's so mortified. But this is on a whole nother level. She's clearly improved since then and has all sorts of new creative ways to soul cast people into whatever she wants. I thought about that, Trevor, but that is, it's kind of funny to think they were kind of. Effectively, in that alley, they were kind of like spooked or approached, and so Yasna, it almost felt like a a jolt reaction to just be like whoa, and like just turns them into fire and like ash <laughs> and stuff. Just like, uh. but here it's like very like calculated and like super 
yeah, it's it's really crazy to navigate what she does. And I think it's really cool because we are really witnessing like the powers with effectively unlimited stormlight from everything that's been going on with like filling all these gemstones that are just scattered everywhere. Everyone's just getting to not worry about stormlight limitations. Right. And it's super cool to see. I was just going to mention that I am kind of left wondering a little bit about how much of this power wheeling is due to the fact that like the realms that, that honors perpendicularity is right there. Is, is this a normal level of power for Yasna? I think the obvious answer to that is no, but then like, what is normal level power Yasna? It, it, is she still, you know, incredibly powerful or is the only reason she can do all of this because of the unlimited stormlight she has access to and the like merging of the realms. I think her and Ivory even talk about that. They're like, Hey, we better use this opportunity while we've got it. And that, yeah. Is that why she can soul cast so flawlessly is because it it even says she's half in Shadesmar. Her, her and Ivory basically dancing in and out of Shadesmar and soul casting whatever they want because they're jumping in and out uh, with the beads and stuff. So. I, as I was reading this scene, I was thinking back to myself a year and a half ago, more than starting the way of Kings. And, and one of the things that we were trying to figure out, Paul, you and I, as we read through the first like half, maybe first third of way of Kings was like, what's the magic system in this world? Like, is there magic? When are we going to run it? Like we, we didn't even see a whole lot of it in the first half of way of Kings. Like when we first saw surge binding, big deal i'm thinking like you know when kaladin got strung up in the storm and we start to see some of those first powers start to emerge we were in awe compare that to what we just what we're witnessing in this chapter of our characters just running around we magic just left and right willy-nilly the incredible things they're doing it's just so far beyond what we could have even imagined what i could have even imagined back in the when we started this it's crazy do you guys sympathize for me with this scene in the back of my head talking about, you know, Kaladin's <laughs> first bridge run and giving it the the impact that it's supposed to have for the reader then? No, it'd be okay. That'd be fine. It Paul and I are, are, are so excited that Kaladin stuck a rock to a wall and and Trevor's over there <laughs> like, oh yeah, you 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 just wait. Yes. You want to There's talk one bit? Go ahead, Elliot. I was going to prompt you. I, I think we're headed for the same thing. I had a I had a confusing moment as I was reading this chapter when Yasna does one of her her soul castings. That the book talks about how the axis of air aligned, and then it, it gets into even some more like kind of scientific jargon there of like how the physics of the soul casting is actually working, which was actually fascinating. But I got caught up in that word. Axi, A X I. And I, I'm like, what is that word? I don't even know what that word means. So I hop onto Google and I'm like, okay, what is Axi? Well, it didn't take me too long to figure out. It, that's not actually a word. It's it's a Brandon Sanderson made this up. It's it's part of the Cosmere. Like that's an element of this fictional world we're in. I didn't even realize. I thought it was just a, a, a real word I didn't know. And so Trevor, I messaged you and I was like, Trevor. I'm deathly afraid of of spoilers. I can't click on any of these links that have just come up on my Google search. Help me figure out what what axi means. And and you sent me some information that was very useful. And you can maybe fill me in here. But basically, what I learned was axi is is like talking about like the actual like molecules of the air, like the individual elements of air, and how they all kind of align themselves to then become what. Yasuna's going to soul cast them into. Did I, did I read that right? Did I understand that correctly? Yeah, it's their interpretation of particles that make up the universe, basically. Anything that's smaller than a grain of dust that we, we know particles can get smaller than this, but we don't have a microscope to look at them. So we're just going to call it axi. That's the word they came up with, and that's what that's what it is. It's their rep. It's their substitution for either molecule or atom. Either way, you want to you want to read that. Got it. 
So I learned a little bit about the science of the Cosmere, or at least Roshar. I hope you enjoyed that. Because for all of its flaws and perks, Rhythm of War is not Oathbringer. Rhythm of War is very different to Oathbringer. Take that information how you will. Rhythm of War is paced completely different to Oathbringer, which that might be good news for you guys, because Oathbringer is kind of slow. In fact, it's really slow in some points. But Rhythm of War is very different than Oathbringer, and it's a lot more science-y. You get to learn a lot of terms in Rhythm of War. I'm in. We get to learn about the, you know, connection between, uh, say, Light Song and Shalon, you know? Just science y connections like that. True.